Okay, so now we're recording. Let me open Keynote, which is here. All right, um, so we're gonna start with assembly. And assembly is a programming language. Uh, there's this thing called MIPS assembly, and it's a programming language that is low level. And I'll tell you what that means. And we're going to learn how to convert from C to MIPS. We're not going to do vice versa, although we might do it for just a few lines, but I'm not going to give you a full program in MIPS and ask you to convert that to C. I will give you a full program in C and ask you to convert that to MIPS at some point. And I may give you a few lines of MIPS and ask you to convert that to C, but it'll be very difficult for you to look at kind of a large program in MIPS and convert that to C. It could be impossible actually sometimes. So what is MIPS? Like, why do we want to learn it? Um, let me kind of give you a very brief kind of introduction to MIPS, tell you kind of why we use it or when we use it, and uh, kind of show you how it's different than C. And then we can, uh, you know, start writing code. We're going to start with the basics. And then um, we're going to, you know, we're going to build on top of the topics that we cover. So we know that this course is computer organization and assembly language. So the MIPS assembly is a big part of this course. And we're going to spend um, today and tomorrow and probably... Uh, all of next week doing MIPS. So when you have code in C, before we're able to execute this code, before we're able to kind of have the CPU, which is really the brain of the computer, execute this code, this code has to go through some sort of translation. So at first, the C code gets translated to another kind of another programming language and then this programming language gets translated to another kind of form. And that would be the instructions that your CPU is going to read. Now, at some point, uh, we're going to talk about that exactly, how those bits go inside the CPU and how the CPU is able to read those bits and do you know, the thing that we want to do. So, but But we're not going to do that. We're going to do that. Uh, we're not going to do that now. We'll do it maybe in a week or maybe in, in 10 days. Um, so the, the piece of software that translates this C code to assembly is called compiler. So for you to be able to execute C code, you have to have a compiler. And the compiler is going to take your C code and it's going to translate that to assembly. Now, this assembly is called MIPS, but there are so many different assembly languages. So, you know, you can have so many different assembly languages. And the one that we're going to learn today is going to be called MIPS, or the one that we're going to learn in this course is going to be called MIPS. And it's a simpler one. So it's one of the simpler ones. It's still very capable. Um, it's not used by your computer or my computer. But uh, again, it's very capable and it's a great language uh, for you to understand kind of the big ideas of computer architecture. So in this course, we're going to talk about some big ideas and it makes actually more sense to start with something that uh, doesn't kind of, is not complex, is not, doesn't contain kind of details that we don't really care about. Um, and that's really uh, what MIPS is. MIPS again is it's a great language for, you know, core. You know, if you want to learn about assembly, it's a great language to be used. And of course, it's used in in actual hardware, just not my computer and your computer. So the question that you probably have is, why is it not used by my computer? And which computers use MIPS? I mean. Can we talk about that for a few seconds or minutes? And and let's let's do that. So when I write code in C, 
And when you write code in C, the C is going to look the same. So my code that is in C and your code that is in C is going to be the same. And because of that, C is not architecture dependent. So when we use the word architecture in those courses in computer architecture or computer organization, we really talk about the CPU mainly. The CPU and the things that are kind of around the CPU, the kind of the memory and how the CPU is connected to the memory, that's really the architecture. Um, but it's really the CPU at, at the heart of it. So if my CPU is different than your CPU, and that's that could be the case, of course, if I have Apple and you have Windows. If I have an Apple computer and you have a Windows computer, our CPUs will be very different because Apple right now, they have their own CPUs and they're very, very different than the CPUs that most Windows computers use, uh, if not all of them. So my CPU is different than your CPU. That being said, the C code is gonna look the same. And because of that, the C code is not architecture dependent, meaning that the C does not depend on the architecture. My architecture could be an Apple architecture and the C is gonna look the same. Your architecture could be an Intel architecture and it'll still look the same. And because of that, this language, just like you know Python and Java and all of those languages that we know, they're not architecture dependent. Now, assembly languages, they are architecture dependent. And in fact, the assembly code that gets created before we create the machine code is going to depend on your architecture. So your architecture or the, you know, the architecture of your CPU, that's what I mean when I say your architecture, is going to determine the language, the assembly language that's used in the translation between the high-level languages such as C to machine code. If you have a MIPS CPU, then your assembly is going to be MIPS. If you have an Intel CPU, then your assembly is going to be Intel, which is different than this. Um, so depending on your CPU, there is going to be you know, a different assembly that your CPU is going to use, or rather that your compiler is going to translate the C code to. And uh, MIPS CPUs are not used in, in our computers. They're not used in general purpose computers. So the computers that you buy that do everything that have Microsoft Word and play music and movies, you know, these are the computers that, that we use. These are not uh, computers that use MIPS CPU. Um, there are systems, digital systems that use MIPS, but they're not, uh, they're not kind of general purpose computers. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's kind of, that's how MIPS, that's just a kind of a brief intro about MIPS. Um, now, after you go from C to assembly, again, depending on your CPU, then there's another translation, and this is all software, another translation in the software that goes from assembly um, to machine code. And this is the code that goes through wires that will go to the CPU and the CPU is going to essentially, you know, read this code and do, you know, whatever it needs to do. I know this kind of sound, this sounds a little abstract for now, but that's okay. As soon as we see examples and how to kind of translate C to MIPS and MIPS to machine code and how the CPU actually reads this, it'll become more clear. It's not going to become perfectly clear yet. We need to cover more things, but slowly it'll make more sense. Um, so in summary, we have code in C, and this is not architecture dependent because again, my C code is gonna look like your C code even though we have different architectures. However, the compiler is gonna translate this C code to assembly code, and this assembly is gonna be different if we have different computers. And again, if we have different machines, even if we have Apple, both of us have Apple, but they have different kind of versions. Let's say one of them is, is older. One of them uh, uses a different CPU. Say one of them uses M1, the other one uses M2. There will be slight kind of differences. Um, so this is, this is generated again, according to, or based on the CPU, even though it's, it's done by a piece of software. 
And then there's another piece of software that's going to take this and translate that to machine code. And then the machine code is going to be executed by the CPU. So this is really, um, um, yeah, that's kind of, again, a very high level overview of what happens. Let's talk about some kind of facts about assembly and how they're different than C. And then I'll pause and see if you have any questions. And after that, maybe we'll just dive right in and do some examples. All right, so assembly language, again, we're gonna learn MIPS. That's the language that we're gonna learn, but there are so many kind of assembly languages. Um, the assembly assembly languages, are, these are called low-level languages. And low-level essentially means that they're hard to maintain, like hard to edit, hard to read, uh, you know, hard to write code in. That's really what low-level programming languages mean. C, for example, the language C is high-level, even though it's, it's uh, kind of lower... I'm, I'm going to use kind of double quotations here, kind of lower level than Python, um, it's still a high level language. So of course, if you compare C with Python, Python is going to be easier to, to read, easier to write code in, easier to maintain, and it's more English-like. So they use a lot of kind of verbs that, that we typically use. And because of that, it's kind of easier. And because of that, uh, it's easier to, you know, to at least uh, uh, learn, not necessarily master. So some languages are easier to learn, but hard to master. We don't want to delve into that kind of that discussion, but Python tends to be an easy language to start learning. But if you might, you know, if you want to do something specific, maybe C will be better. So again, that's a discussion for another day, um, but it's... Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, with, with certainty, we can all probably agree that Python is more kind of user-friendly, programmer-friendly. Um, even then, C is going to be uh, still a high-level language. So even, the, even, even though C kind of looks more primitive than Python, uh, it's, uh, it's still considered a high-level language. Let me see, there's a question in the chat. Um, uh, so Grace is saying from previous classes, high level programming languages are defined at least partially by their similarity to human language. Would you say this is accurate? I don't know if it's, I, I wouldn't say that it's accurate, but I wouldn't say that it's wrong. I think it's more than that. So a human language, is one aspect, um, but I don't think human language is the determining factor that defines whether you know a language is high level or low level. It's actually you know that definition is not. There's no clear definition. I think different people maybe have may have different definitions. Different books may have different ideas. If you ask me, I would say that's not accurate. Uh, it's not kind of. It, it's again, it's not wrong. It's right. But it's not, it's certainly not complete because you do want to look at, you know, how easy it is to write code in it, how easy it is to maintain it, meaning kind of edit the code, how easy it is to, um, uh, you know, again, to read the code and to, um, to, to modify it. Um, so it's, it's multiple aspects. And you will see that uh, in assembly, uh, things are going to be much more difficult to kind of edit uh, and to write code in and to read. It'll 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 be an effort. I mean, we're going to learn how to do it, but uh, and hopefully we'll get good at it and you'll be fast at doing it. But compared to C, I mean, you're going to love C. You're going to say, you know, C is is amazing compared to assembly. Even though right now maybe you're looking at C and you're saying, oh, it's it's nothing like Python. Once we do assembly, you're going to really appreciate, you're going to see. Um, the other thing is each assembly is specific to a particular computer architecture. So I did say that. So the assembly that gets generated is determined by your CPU. 
So in this case, that's a MIPS assembly. But if I were to compile my C code on my computer, of course, it's not going to be MIPS assembly because my CPU is not MIPS. So this is really what this bullet point is saying is that it depends on the architecture, um, which is really not the case for high-level programming languages like C or Python or Java. That's not the case. If you send me your code in C, it'll probably run on my computer. Um, of course, there are some kind of exceptions. There, there is some kind of code that maybe I would need to kind of tweak, but almost all the code that I write in C is going to work on your computer. Um, and we have different, you know, kinds or, or categories of CPUs. Again, we talked about MIPS. This is the one that's really good for, for education. It's good. It's simple. It's a good um, assembly to learn for us to, to really understand the big ideas of computer architecture that all CPUs share. Um, and we have the Intel, which is really popular. And this is really the CPU that Apple used to use maybe, I don't know, maybe five years ago or four years ago. Um, right now, they don't use Intel. I think all of their products are non-Intel. I think all of them right now with no exception. Um, but it used to be the case that even maybe last year, you could buy an Intel Mac. Um, so, so there are different categories. You don't really need to know, you know, PIC or Spark or, or Alpha. These are just different categories of CPUs. Um, you may have heard of some of them possibly, although maybe unlikely, um, but there are many more, you know, many more categories. Um, we're going to be just studying MIPS in this course. Um, I, one thing that I do want to say, which I'm going to probably talk about more um, later, is that some CPUs are more complex. And I think I did mention that a few minutes ago. And Intel, for example, is a category of CPU that is actually very complex. Um, so Intel is very complex compared to MIPS. MIPS kind of belongs to a category of kind of simpler CPUs, not necessarily kind of inferior or slower. It's just that they have a simpler simpler design. Intel CPUs, they're, they have a complex design. Um, okay, so assembly languages are converted into machine using the assembler. So this is really this part. So an assembly language is converted to machine code using the assembler. Um, and in pure assembly, <clears throat> excuse me, in pure assembly, and we're going to do pure assembly only. At some point, maybe next week, I will show you maybe one or two instructions that are not pure assembly. Um, but most of the instructions, almost all the instructions that we're going to look at are going to be pure assembly. And what that means is one instruction, essentially one, um, one instruction here in assembly, one statement, one line is going to translate to one instruction in machine code. So the number of lines here, one, two, three, four, would be one, two, three, four, assuming that this is pure assembly. So that's really uh, what it means. Um, so each line, each assembly line or assembly statement, same thing, is going to correspond to one basic operation uh, in machine code. And we'll talk about what those operations are. In fact, I think today we're going to do a few examples of some basic operations. All right, so uh, some history here. I think uh, uh, maybe maybe tomorrow I can provide more history. Uh, I think, or maybe I can share with you some documents that you can read, but I don't want to uh, talk too much about that in this video. Uh, just so you know that this MIPS chip was designed from the ground up, meaning that um, it wasn't kind of, it wasn't built on top of something that already existed. Um, and it, <coughs> excuse me. And this uh, MIPS Technologies, which is really the company um, that that designed those MIPS chip, chips, um, was one of the first companies that designed those simple architecture. So 
RISC is a category of CPUs for simple, again, simple architecture. So RISC stands for reduced instruction set. Uh, C, I don't think it's, uh, hmm, is it computing? Well, I have to look it up. I haven't, I haven't done that in a while. You know, I used to teach this course every semester, but then I stopped teaching it uh, computer. Um, okay, so R stands for reduced, and this really is telling you that it's kind of a simpler, a simpler kind of of CPUs. Again, that's not going to mean much to you because for you to know what's simple and what complex are, you have to compare it with something else. For now, we don't need to worry about that. I don't want to make this course or this class very abstract. So, if you feel that you can't really kind of visualize what that means or that's fine that's perfectly fine i don't expect you to it just means that those mips cpus are simpler and that's enough and the reason why we study mips instead of intel cpus is because they're simple they're elegant and we don't need to be bogged down with a lot of details that are really not that important to the big uh, again big ideas of computer architectures so um, that's really the reason why. And it's actually a very good reason. So it's a, it's a good enough reason for us to study kind of simpler CPUs. All right. Um, so memory addresses are in bytes. This is something that we've actually seen in C. So when I, let me actually create a new here, a new matrix. Remember we did the table here before? Let me do a few here and let me do 16 here let me do it it is enough and let me do okay let me create borders here so what that slide is saying here um, is that when we have a memory which is a ram each kind of unit is going to be a single byte. So, and each unit is going to have an address. And the address is an address of a byte. So the address of this one is zero. If you remember, we did one, two, up to seven here. And then we did eight here, you know, nine here. And then we have 16 here. So we have 15 here. You know, we have those addresses in the RAM. And each address is going to refer to A byte. It's not going to refer to a bit. It's going to refer to a byte. Um, yeah. So eight chunks, of course, is going to be a byte, and um, and then we're going to use this term called word, and word is going to be four bytes. So here we have one, two, three, four. That's going to be a word. I can merge it. That's going to be four bytes, and there's going to be another word here. So each four bytes, each four bytes that are consecutive are going to be called words. Each four bytes, yeah, is, is going to be called a word. Um, what else here? Yeah, so when we say that memory is byte addressable, meaning that that means if I give you an address, like 5 or 10 or 20, that address is going to refer to a byte. That's what, what we mean when we say byte addressable. All right. So this memory is going to be connected to the CPU. It's going to be connected to the brain of the computer. Let me actually do this. So I'm going to create another rectangle here, and I'm going to call it CPU. So 
I'm going to show you later on next week kind of a much more sophisticated diagram. But for now, I want you to know that uh, the RAM is connected to the CPU. And essentially what happens is once we take uh, the C code, once we compile it, and then once we assemble it, those zeros and ones are going to be living where in the RAM. So let, let's kind of do a quick exercise here. Um, how, many, how many bits is here? Can you, or how many bytes? Let's do how many bytes. How many bytes is, is easier? How many bytes? Four, that's good. Because each, maybe what I should have done is this. I mean, you got it right. It, you weren't confused by the spaces. But essentially, uh, we should separate the bytes more. We don't have to do that really because, again, I think you, you, you kind of knew that. So this would be kind of one byte, that would be one byte, and that would be one byte, and that would be one byte. So each instruction, each operation slash instruction is going to be four bytes. And that's going to be the case actually with the MIPS that we study. Now, in other uh, CPUs and in other architectures, an instruction can be actually eight bytes. So an instruction can be typically either four bytes or eight bytes. And the MIPS that we're gonna be studying is the MIPS that uses four bytes per instruction. So how many instructions do we have here? Well, we have one, two, three, four, and each one's going to be uh, four bytes. So if we were to load you know, those four instructions to the memory, maybe we can allocate this space for those instructions. And I just kind of picked a random space. So essentially this would be for the first instruction. First uh, operation or instruction. This is for the second one. Hmm, I think I colored double the amount of space that I need by mistake. That would be the third operation. And that would be the fourth operation. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the CPU is connected to the RAM and it's connected in, in its simplest form. So again, we're gonna start with something really, really basic. This is not really how our computers, you know, uh, this is not how the CPU is connected to the RAM in our computers, but I'm gonna start with the simplest uh, kind of version of it. So that would be CPU, RAM, and we're and these are connected through wires, actual wires. So there is going to be essentially wires that are going from the CPU to the RAM. And those wires are going to be used, as you probably would guess, to, to trans, transfer the values of the bits. So how many wires do we have? Well, first of all, let me tell you that we actually have two sets of wires. And the reason why they're two separate because each wire is unidirectional. So let's say this wire is gonna send data from the RAM to the CPU. And this wire or this set of wires is going to trans transfer data from the CPU to the RAM. And this set of wires, I know that's a lot of information here that I'm throwing at you, but that's okay. If you have any questions, I'm going to pause in a few seconds, see if you have any questions. Um, this 
set of wires is going to be eight wires. And because it's eight uh, wires, that means it's going to be kind of, um, uh, it's, you, can, you can transfer eight bits, okay? I, actually, I should have said, at some point, we're going to do something where we have eight wires, but for now, let's do 32 wires. So let's do four bytes. Let me just do four bytes of wires. Does that make sense? Again, that is a lot of information here, but that's okay. We will, uh, I'll pause and, and answer any questions that you have. I did say eight at the beginning because at some point when we talk about the hardware, we're gonna simplify it even further and we're gonna do an example of eight wires. But for now, we want to think of this set of wires as 32 wires and this set of wires as 32 wires. And this is really called bus. A bus is a set of wires, um, some number of wires. In this case, it's going to be 32. Let me pause here um, and see if you have any questions before we talk about how instructions or operations are being transferred from here kind of to the CPU. Okay, so it seems that it makes sense. This is great. Um, so um, what's gonna happen here is the the CPU is going to start kind of requesting instructions from the RAM. And it's going to request instructions from, from the RAM by sending an address. So it's going to almost like say, get me the data at this address that I'm going to indicate in those four bytes and those 32 wires. And let's say, for example, just to do a, a simple example here, let's say I'm going to send the value eight. Actually, eight might be confusing because it again is a special number let me do um, in this case let me do 12. so let's say uh, the cpu is going to say it's going to send this number 12 to the ram through this bus okay so 12 is going to kind of move of course how do, how is 12 going to look like do you know how 12 is going to look like? It's actually very basic. First of all, we have um, four bytes. So that's a lot of bits, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, eight, four, zero, zero. Let me make the font a little smaller. So this is how 12 looks like in four bytes. Are we good? Give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. Because that's four and eight. That's 12. Okay. So the CPU is going to send those through this thing that I'm going to call address bus. So I called it bus, and right now I'm calling it address bus. So slowly I'm kind of adding more, throwing more terminology at you. But that's okay. Everything is going to be in the slides. And if you don't see it in this slide deck, you're going to see it in the one that we cover next or maybe tomorrow. Um, so don't feel that you have to memorize anything that's not in the slide deck. So I need, I'm sending 12 and 12 is going to be sent, you know, on the wires. And what that means, by the way, if it's, if it's not clear, is that the first wire is going to have no voltage. The second wire is going to have no voltage. The third wire is going to have some voltage, so some energy. The fourth wire is going to have some energy, then no energy, no voltage, no energy, nothing here. That's what's going to happen on those 32 wires. Now, when the RAM receives this number 12, what's going to happen, and this is something that hopefully we'll have time to discuss uh, maybe in the fourth week, what's going to happen is this byte, the byte that has the address 12, is going to activate. What that means is four bytes and i'm going to say it slow and then i'm going to you know pause and see if you have any questions four bytes starting at this byte that activated are going to go and through the 
this bus, which is called the data bus, I'm going to send those four bytes through the data bus and the CPU is going to, you know, receive those four bytes and do something with them. Again, let me say it one more time. So the CPU wants to, wants those four bytes. Let's say the CPU wants those four bytes because it knows this is an instruction and the CPU, CPU needs to execute that instruction. So what happens is the CPU is going to ask the RAM for those four bytes by sending the address of the byte or the address of the first byte out of those four bytes. So that's going to be 12. So 12 is going to go here. It's going to get to the RAM. And this byte is going to activate. And then four bytes, you know, those four bytes are going to go up like this and through the data bus back to the CPU. And the CPU is going to, in, in almost all cases, it's going to execute, you know, whatever is here. Let me pause here and see if you have any questions. Okay. So when we have code, let me get rid of this and get rid of that. Let me keep keep this for now. Uh, actually, let's let's try to guess what the what the addresses of those are. So 16 plus 8, 24, plus 8, 32, plus 8, 40, and plus 8, 48. So that the, the address of this one is 48. Okay, so let's say the CPU wants to execute your program, which actually lives here. What happens is the CPU is going to send the address of the first byte you know for the four bytes that we want to fetch which is this the first operation so it's going to send 48 excuse me so what is 48 48 is 32 plus 8 so this one is going to be again the value of this one is 1 the value of this one is 2 4 we don't want that 8 we'll keep 8 we don't want 16 we want 32 so this binary is going to be 48 because that's 32. And that's, oh, actually we need 16. So, sorry. So that would be 32. And that would be 16, which gives us 48. Is that good? Does, do you agree with all of this? Did I make a mistake or does that make sense? So again, I'll, I'll pause here, make sure that you understand what I'm doing here. The value of this one is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. And this is 32. 16 plus 32, that's 48, which is really the address of this one. So that's going to be sent through the address bus. And that's going to activate this byte. And those four bytes, which I'm going to change the color of to green, those four bytes are going to go through the data bus and the CPU is going to execute them. And then the CPU is going to say, I'm done executing this instruction. I need to fetch the next instruction. So what happens next is the CPU is going to say, let me take this initial address that I started with and let me add four to it. Because if I add four to it, I would end up here. And then I want to fetch this instruction. So... Simply, we would say this is the value of this one is one, the value of this one's two, the value of this one's four. We can simply make a put a one here. And right now, this is going to be uh, 52, which is 48 plus four. And 52 is going to go through the data bus and it's going to activate this byte. And then four bytes starting at this byte are going to go through the data bus, through those 32 wires back to the CPU and the CPU is going to execute those instructions. Now, again, again, this is a simplified version of how, how it works, but it's still very valuable for you to get, again, the, the big picture. Even if I'm missing a lot of details here, that's okay. Okay, the CPU is going to execute the second instruction and then it's going to say, okay, I'm done. I need to get the third instruction. Let me add another four. 
adding another four to this is essentially adding eight and subtracting four. So it looks like this. Is that good? Okay. So we, we were at, so there's 48, 52. And right now we do 56. So this is 56. Same thing. We go here. This one's going to activate this byte. And then four bytes starting at this byte are going to go through the, the data bus back to the CPU. And then, of course, the CPU is going to say, okay, I need another four. It'll add four. And then that will be sent through the address bus. And that's going to activate this byte. Four bytes starting at this byte are going to go through the data bus back to the CPU. And the CPU is going to execute that instruction. So that's how it works. Again, in simple, in a, in, you know, in a simplified version, that's really what happens. So, so this is a cycle. So what I explained to you is really a cycle. Um, we fetch the instruction and we execute the instruction. And then we also increment the program counter. The program counter is really the value that contains, you know, the address that I want to fetch. So here, if I were to be add a little bit of details here, and I'll be adding a lot more details again in the the next few days. But what you want to think of the program counter as a, you can think of it as a variable. It's called PC, which stands for program counter. Again, you can think of it as a variable. And that variable, oh, let, me, let me pick a, a color fill, or maybe, yeah, this is a, hmm, let me, pick this one yeah so a program counter is essentially a you can think of it as a variable and this variable contains the address of the instruction that i want to fetch next that's really uh, what it is so you might be asking um, why are we incrementing before executing. Well, it doesn't matter. You can execute before you increment. The truth is these two things happen at the same time. So something that you're going to learn in this course is that in hardware, things happen in parallel. This is different than in software. So in software, when we have code, we typically execute this one, then execute this one, then execute this one. We go kind of in sequence or in series. However, in the hardware, because we have different pieces that are isolated, we can actually do multiple things at the same time. And after we fetch the instruction from the memory, we can do two things at the same time. We can actually execute the instruction. And at the same time, we can increment the program counter. Essentially, we can add four to it so that as soon as we're done executing the instruction, we're going to fetch the next value. So let me give you an example. Again, another example that is oversimplified, but that's okay. I want to make sure that we understand the big picture of it. So let's assume that executing the instruction takes, you know, say four seconds. And let's say adding four to the program counter, which is if you, again, the program counter is, you can think of it as a variable. Think of it as a variable that contains the address of the instruction that you want to fetch next. So let's say you fetch an instruction. There's two ways that you can go about doing these two things. And once I explain it, I'm going to pause make sure that you understand it because this is one of the big ideas of computer architecture, which is things happening in parallel. This is something that we need to kind of talk about more next week and the following week, but in the hardware, things happen in parallel. So there's two approaches. The first approach would be, let's execute. That's gonna take four seconds. Then let's add four, and that's going to take one second. So in total, it's going to take five seconds, 
right? Because it's going to take four seconds to execute the instruction. Now, now we don't know what execute means yet. That's okay. Kind of bear with me. You can think of exec execute as adding two numbers for now, just adding, you know, five to six. So let's say it takes four seconds to execute. And let's say it takes one second. Oh, did I say that takes one second here? I thought I did say, let me do this. This is important. And this is important too. So one way to do it would be to execute and then add, and that's gonna be five seconds. Is that, does that make sense? Let me pause here and make sure that this makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, I wanna hear, I wanna hear a question or let me know what kind of, what part doesn't make sense and I can explain it again. So let me quickly kind of uh, explain what I'm saying here. When an instruction gets fetched from the RAM to the CPU, the CPU needs to execute that instruction. And then also the CPU needs to increment the PC, which is again, think of it as a variable that contains the instruction that I'm gonna be fetching next. And then once the instruction finishes executing, I'm gonna use the value in the PC to fetch the, the next instruction. That's how it works. So this is one way to do it, but then there's a second approach, which is much better, which is let's execute, and that's gonna take four seconds, and let's add four while we're executing. And that's gonna take one second. However, in total, this will take four seconds. Why is that? Because I was adding the four to the program counter while I was executing the instruction. And I can only do that if I have separate components, like separate hardwares, one for you know adding the four, one for executing the instruction. But if I can do that, then in total, it'll take four seconds and that'll save me, you know, it'll save me 20%. That's 20% faster. Instead of taking five seconds per instruction, right now I'm taking four seconds per instruction. That's a substantial decrease. Do you, does that make sense what's happening here? Do you have any questions about this? Exactly. So because it happens in parallel, um, because it happens in parallel, it in total, it takes four seconds because while I'm executing, I'll be doing the addition. And after the first second, I'll be done with this and I'll have three seconds left here. Um, and because of that, I can only spend four seconds. Or rather, I only need four seconds. So going back to the slide, again, whether we increment or execute or execute or increment, it doesn't really matter because these two happen at the same time. So we fetch the instruction. After we fetch it, we can increment the program counter. And at the same time, we can execute the instruction. And once we're done executing the instruction, we're gonna fetch the next instruction. So this is the cycle. We keep doing that until we fetched all instructions. So the MIPS that we're gonna be studying is called MIPS 32. And 32 
is essentially indicates the number of bytes, number of bits rather, for each instruction. Now, when your architecture is 32, then that's, that's what it means. It means number of bits for each, each instruction is 32. And also it means the address bus is also 32 wires. And it also means that the data bus is 32 wires. Again, uh, this would be the address bus. I'm gonna actually write this here because it's the bus, the set of wires that contain, what do they contain? They contain the address, it's called the address bus. They contain the address that you wanna fetch. That's exactly what that is. And the other one is called data bus. This is called data bus because it's the bus, it's the set of wires that contain the data that are be, that is, that's being fetched from the RAM to the CPU. Now, because the address bus is 32 bits, we need 32 wires. And because of that, the PC, you know, we, we talked about the PC, the program counter, and we said that this one is going to contain the address of the next instruction that I'm going to fetch. This one should also have 32 bits. Now, at some point in this course, we're going to talk about how bits are even constructed in the hardware. Uh, but for now, again, we can think of it as a variable. And this one contains 32 bits. And those 32 bits go through the 32 wires. One byte gets activated, four bytes starting at that byte you know, get fetched and through the data bus, they're sent to the CPU. So the question here that Grace is asking, um, is, the, is, is this one kind of output and this one is input? That's okay, but there's something that I omitted and it's that this, particular data bus is actually bi-directional. I did say at some point that it's unidirectional, but that really was not accurate. And I kind of, I thought that you don't need to know that it's bi-directional, but actually you do need to know very, because very soon we're gonna be using it in like this. But even if it's bi-directional, you cannot send the address. So if you wanna send the address to the RAM so that one byte gets activated so that four bytes can be fetched back to the CPU, you have to use the address bus. You cannot use the data bus to send the address. You can use the data bus to send data to the RAM, and we're gonna see that, or you can use the data bus to bring data from the RAM, but you cannot use this data bus to send the address. If you want, if you wanna send the address to the RAM so that you can fetch something or you can change something, we'll talk about that later, it's gonna to have to be sent through the address bus. Do you have any questions about this? And of course, the program counter is 32 bits because the program counter is connected to the bus, to the address bus. So if you have 32 wires here, you need 32 bits here. All right, do you have any questions before we stop the recording and start with a new one? So this was 
kind of a brief introduction to MIPS and to kind of the memory and the CPU and how instructions are fetched. So it's a very high level introduction, but this one should be hopefully enough, you know, to go to the next step, which is a little more detailed. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording and then we're gonna start with a new recording.